Good day, everyone. My name is David Williams, Executive Director of the International Association for Energy Economics. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Lowering Emissions by Curtailing Renewables in, in the Power Systems. We're grateful to Herman Morales Espana from TNO for today's timely discussion. First, a little bit about the International Association for Energy Economics. We are the largest association specializing in the field of energy economics and provide uh, an exchange of ideas, experience, and issues among professionals interested in the field. The organization produces two professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations, along with a host of other products and services that you can find at our website at www.iae.org. If you're not already a member of the association, we welcome you to join. A few housekeeping matters in regard to today's webinar before I hand things over to our speaker. First, this webinar is being recorded for those that cannot participate in today's live event. If you have questions for our speaker, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window uh, to type your question. We've allocated sufficient time during and after this presentation to, uh, to entertain your questions. A special thanks uh, out to the Benelux Association for Energy Economics as well today for helping to bring about this, uh, this webinar on the IAEE platform. And now I'd like to introduce you to our presenter, Herman Morales Espana, researcher at TNO. Herman, over to you. So, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, I am Herman Morales. I am a researcher here at the Applied Research, Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research, TNO. Um, yeah, should I now start the presentation or should we wait a little bit? No, it's, uh, it's quite fine. Please, uh, please uh, begin. Okay. So then let me share my screen. Um, here it is. So then you can, I assume you all can see my screen. Yeah, it's clear. Yes, nice. So the presentation is, uh, is about lowering emission by curtailing renewables and power systems. So that was a really little introduction about myself. Uh, I want to mention that this, what I am presenting here is the result of a collaboration with uh, other two people. That is Josai, my colleague at TNO, and Elis Nikander. He is a PhD student in KTH in Sweden. He was doing a stay last year here at TNO. So that is one of the res results of the collaboration. Um, so the paper is available online. Uh, it is already under review, so hopefully it will be soon. Uh, there will be a, an official a journal paper of this. And the paper is called Reducing CO2 Emissions by Curtailing Renewables, an example from optimal power system operation. So there are. Uh, we will share the slides later, so there you can find the, the link where you can find the, the, the preprint available. Just to start, uh, I would like you to, to go to menti.com or to scan with your phone cameras to scan the, the QR code, uh, because I want to start with some questions. And during the presentation, there will be some, some questions just to interact with the audience, and also I am curious about your opinion about different aspects. So I will give some time for you to, to log in. I see already some people entering. In a second, I will. Yeah. I will keep this, this screen. And then I will show the, the results. So there you will see that uh, I am asking in which country are you? I am very curious, like the audience, where they are from. I was thinking if everybody is from Latin America or Spanish speakers, maybe I, I, I give the talk in Spanish. But, but I see the Netherlands as the main one, Germany, Belgium, the US. So that is nice. I will give some other seconds. 
especially for people to log in in there because through the presentation there will be uh, more questions so it will be nice if you have already that um, if you have already menti open in your browser so i see around 50 people have replied so it will change the screen a little bit for you to can you see the the results of the menti in the screen yeah. So there you can see the results. See. Yeah. So it seems that the Netherlands, where I am from, okay, no, actually I am from Colombia, but I am living in the Netherlands now. The highest number of participants. Okay. Ah, Iran, Chile, Colombia. Okay, then I can move on with the presentation. There will be other questions to fill it in. In, in Menti. So I think you are seeing my slides again. Yeah, I see, I see yes? Okay, <laughs> nice. I like to get some feedback just to be sure I am not lost and presenting something else. Uh, so this is the light of the presentation. I will give an introduction, uh, basically, very typical one that we want a high share of renewables in our power systems or in, uh, energy system. Uh, I will talk about how, how to achieve that, uh, some of the things of what not to do, that is the main topic of the presentation. And the other thing is about what to do. And at the end, I will uh, finish with some conclusions. So, Then the introduction, uh, yeah, the main objective is to accommodate high share of renewables, of variable renewable energies in an economic, uh, economical and environmental way. So that is what we want in the systems. So the main challenges we have is to, to deal with the variability and uncertainty. That is basically demanding more flexibility for, from the system so that, we, that the system can accommodate the shares of the high shares of variable renewables. And then there is also the problem for the investors, that is their investment recovery. So how they can record their investments. If everything is full of renewables and, and all the prices are zero, then that uh, becomes a problem for the producers. Some of the questions is how, how to how to do that? So one way will be by forcing the variable renewables into a system. Uh, for example, that they get by law, almost by regulation, that they have priority of dispatch. That first they should be dispatched at all cost, and then you see what else you can dispatch in the system. Uh, renewables are also forced in the system just by having installations behind the uh, the meter generation. And just because, yeah, the, the solar, for example, that is produced in the, in the roofs of the houses, yeah, nobody is usually controlling those and they are just, whatever they can produce, they are just fed into the system. And also through subsidies, usually the subsidies, they are based on energy and the more they produce, they, they can get a subsidy for that. They can get better compensated. So there is an incentive for the renewables to have negative bids to force themselves into the system. So, before continuing uh, with the presentation, I, I'm really curious about another, what is your perception before knowing about this presentation? Did you think that curtailing renewables could lower pollution? That is the other question uh, I have in, in Menti. So, then I will share the screen, then you can see the, the, the results. I am I really wonder about that because I, I don't think it's 
that easy to, it's very counterintuitive. And I think that it will show some paradoxical results. So there is a maybe here winning. And of course, <laughs> yeah, of course, that, that was difficult. I, I think something that, that helps me to, to, to reach these results that I will show is more that I am an electrical engineer and, 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 and all my research has been more focused about optimal operation of power system, optimal operations and modeling. And that is where I could see how, when you are dealing with the, with the constraints of the system, how that can uh, lead to this. So we have eight people saying that no way, that cannot be. Yeah, I think that is a useful belief. And a lot of regulation is based on that. So we need to force them into the system and just because why to curtail renewables? It is for free and or almost for free and with and free and no pollution. So why, why to curtail them? So maybe, of course, hmm, there are some people that write that says, of course, I don't know. So I hope that you can have a, a better idea about how to answer these questions after this presentation. So then let's continue. I will continue sharing my screen. And, okay, my the presentation. Then how to reach these results? How to accumulate high shares of variable renewable energy sources in an economical and environmental way? So what I will show here are some conceptual examples that we can see, hopefully we can see uh, what is going on and what can happen. So I want to show things that we shouldn't do or the system shouldn't do. Then I will just show a case, a case study we did here at TNO uh, using the Pitts model, the power system model. We show a case study of one example of things that maybe are better to do. Uh, so then just to show some evidence of negative bidding, because as I said before, okay, the, uh, in a market, the renewables also bid in the, in the, in the market. And then, yeah, how are you, how are they forcing renewables into a system? So here I want to show some evidence of that, that is in, in different countries, you can find similar results. Those are, for example, graphs of bid volumes. So here you have uh, the upper graph is bid volumes between minus 100 euros per megawatt hour and minus 20 euros per megawatt hour. And the bottom graph are the bid volumes between minus 500 euros per megawatt hour and minus 100 euros per megawatt hour. This is the case of the Netherlands for last year, for one month between February and March. There you can see the wind production in blue and the, the bits that appear in the market, these negative volumes. So if you see, for example, the bottom graph, they, they are not exactly the same scale. Uh, the, the blue line has the, the axis of the left and the, the orange, the axis of the right. Uh, but you can see there already a high correlation that 80% of the production was already bidding between minus 500 of wind production between minus 500 euros per megawatt hour and minus 100. So that is a, yeah, minus 500 is the floor, the, that is the, the most negative you can bid. And then, yeah, then you can see a very high correlation, actually. Uh, you cannot find a perfect correlation because the bid is based on a, on a prediction of a forecast and the blue line is the actual wind production. But then you can see that most of those uh, negative buildings come from wind, from the high production of wind. So this is to show some evidence in the paper. We have more evidence of our country. Now, maybe the, mainly the North Pole market, uh, but the same happens in other countries. I think also in the US, uh, there is uh, places where there are feeding tariffs, they always, they also just beat the negative uh, tariff they get, the negative energy price. So before showing the examples, I will show some previous findings. So there is a paper here uh, about the, what is the cost of negative bidding by wind. And what they did is that they have like a unit commitment problem and they solve the optimal operation of the system with different bits of, of wind, different negative bits, okay, from zero to minus 300. 
So here, just to show that uh, the results for a call unit, what happened when the bits were more and more negative? So these are the ratios compared with the case where uh, there was zero price bidding. And you see that in the minus 300 uh, negative bidding of win, there was more cycling force to a units, to a, in this case, the call units. And so that means more startups and that is more expensive and more pollutive. So that increases cost. And that is also, that also increased the, the emissions. So this is another study that we found about in, investigating the economic value of flexible solar plant operation. And uh, here, basically what they are saying is that solar is perfectly capable of providing reserves. They have already some pilots in USA, the large scale uh, solar providing reserves. And basically if solar provides reserves and becomes part of the solution and not part of the problem, then they can displace other units that are providing reserves. So in that way, they can also, they implicitly pollute less because you need less of the coal and gas units in this case to provide reserves because solar can deal with that. And, and you don't need to plan that much reserve for, uh, for a source that is flexible. Then in this case, it's not exactly the same result that I will show here because actually they could accommodate more renewables by, by displacing others, other technologies because they can also provide reserves. But those are, uh, that we are aware of, those are one, two of the very few cases that they show that actually having flexibility in the variable renewables can actually lower pollution. There are a lot of results showing uh, that can lower costs, but those are the very few we have found about that they can lower actually pollution. Then I, go, I will go to examples about what not to do. So usually why do we have, uh, the curtailment of variable renewable energies. So yeah, it is more or less understood. It is un, uh, accepted that in high penetration shares of variable renewable energies, then the curtailment increases. And usually the reasons, the, the accepted reasons are that, yeah, you can have an overproduction of, of renewables. So for example, of wind, if there is a storm, instead of producing too much, then you need to protect the turbines and you need to turn them off. So because of security reasons and or line congestions, if you are injecting renewables to a system, to a network that doesn't have enough capacity to distribute it, then yeah, you also need to curtail renewables. So usually the technical reasons are about system security to not damage the system. And what about economical reasons? So that is the part I would show here where actually it is feasible, it is okay, it is technically okay to dispatch the renewables, but I will show examples where it is not economically good to dispatch the renewables or not, and even not environmentally good to dispatch the renewables at full potential. So in the paper that I mentioned at the beginning, the, uh, there are many illustrative examples. And here I will show you three. Uh, the illustrative examples are based on unit commitment and economic dispatch. Unit commitment is more about uh, dealing with units, the on-off decisions and some non-linear decisions there like the minimum output and the startup decisions, the minimum up and down times. And the economic dispatch is more fixing the optimal level of production for the units. So the examples are for, yes. Uh, I have one question uh, in the meantime. Uh, yeah. Why do VRE bits bid until a minus 500 euro per megawatt hour if the subsidies are lower? Could you answer yes, that so, question before we go on? Yes, so uh, thanks for the question. The, the subsidies in the Netherlands, they are uh, a kind of bidding premium. I don't know how I would classify it, but they are called SD plus, but basically they recover part their cost or their losses. So they really have the incentive to produce at minus 500, even if the price is minus 500, because they will recover that. There will be a subsidy that will say, okay, you should recover this in the year. And because you didn't record it, we give you the extra, what you, the money that they were missing. So there is a budget to distribute to the renewable sources. And as long as there is enough budget, they can recover that. So they don't have 
any incentive to curtail at all. They have all incentives to produce as much as possible. And then they go out and, and they bid the, the minimum possible value that the market accept, that the market accept that is minus 500. Um, yeah, there are others that make some calculations and they prefer to not offer that. But it's main, as show also in this case, what is the cause of negative bidding? The negative bids appears because of subsidy. So usually with the feeding tariffs, let's say that is minus 10, minus that is 10, 20, 40 euros per, per megawatt hour. So that is what they bid, minus 10 or minus 40. So that is why. Uh, so for these examples, uh, there is also a CO2 price of 25 euros per ton. And they are in, in, internalized already in, in the bids that I will show. And those cases are based on, on, on some real realistic data also taken from, from the paper I showed there. So let's start with this first example. It's about startup of the units. So here we have a, a residual or net load. I don't know if you can see the mouse, uh, the pointer of my mouse, but that is the, the black solid line. So that is basically what is left after the renewables are producing, in this case is wind. So here you have all the wind available and what is not available, there is another unit that is a coal unit. So this is a coal unit and these are the characteristics. That is the maximum output 200, the minimum output IT and the cost of producing with this unit, 38, 0.8 um, euros per megawatt hour and the emissions are here also, the startup cost and the emissions of the startup. Then these are the results. If, if we want to dispatch wind at the maximum capacity, then we have here the average cost and the total cost. And before continuing with that, I want to go to, to the next question. Is here we are dispatching wind for this example at the maximum possible. This is what is available. And then the rest is being covered by the by the coal, that is the only other unit we have in this example. Then the question is, is there a better solution? And then I want you to go to, to Menti again. Then you can see if there is a better solution. So one option is that, uh, like no, Win is already as a maximum, so there is no better solution. You are dispatching win as all possible win available, uh, maybe, or curtail win in the second hour or curtail win in the third hour, or that you don't know. So I will give some time. So, so far, the first option is that maybe there is one that says yes, Cortel win in two hours. Or just Cortel win in the second hour. So you, hmm, the option winning is curtail win in hours two and three. So you can continue voting. I will say, uh, change the, the screen again. And I want you to see here the average cost. That is what I am highlighting here, the average cost of providing this demand. So that is just the total cost dividing, divided by the total demand of the system. So the average cost of producing that is 76.5 euros per, mega, per megawatt hour. And the cost of that coal unit is 38, so almost twice. And the average emissions is 1.62 ton per megawatt hour. And the emissions of that, of the coal unit is 0 0.8, so almost twice again. So that means that with this solution, 
the average emission is is more expensive than if you provide everything by coal. So it will be actually cheaper and less polluted if you provide everything by uh, with the coal unit. And why? Because of the startup decision that is there. The startup is very expensive for this type of unit and very polluted. You need a lot of uh, extra energy just to, to get the unit running. So the result about if there is a better solution, the one that won was yes to curtail when in, in hours two and three. And actually that is is the that is is the actually the solution. And what happened here is if you curtail wind for those two hours, then the receivable demand becomes constant and you don't need to shut down the unit. And if you don't shut down the unit, then you just have the variable cost and the variable emissions for the coal unit uh, for this for these four hours, just for the time. And yeah, you miss some renewables, but at the end you lower the total cost by 78% and you lower the emissions by 77%, just because you avoid the startup, uh, the startup process. That is actually the reason that in the paper I mentioned above about the impact of wind negative EA, that is why they attribute uh, the cost of increasing emissions. The more you try to convert renewables, then the, you need more cycling with the units or then more, uh, more startup decisions. Then now I will go to the other example that is about steep ramps. In this example about the steep ramps, then again, there is a, a residual load that we have here, the, the solid line, and there are the wind is already discounted, it's producing a maximum. And we have three units, a wind unit, uh, a CCGT unit, These are, they are both uh, gas units and a gas turbine unit. The maximum output, they don't have problems, but they have enough capacity to supply all the demand, but they have a ramp limit. Uh, they, apart from wind, the cheapest unit is 120 uh, megawatts per hour as ramp, and the, the second unit is 100. And here you have the, the cost, and, and emissions. So the, the CCGT unit is the cheaper one and then the most expensive and the most polluted is the GT unit. Then the result for this case is a uh, average cost of 21.3 and the emissions 0 0.26. So basically what happened here is the residual load. Okay, first you supply the renewables and then you supply, you use the next cheap option. That is the CCGT unit. Then you supply the unit and because the unit doesn't have enough ramp, then the part that cannot be supplied is the is supplied by the the gas turbine unit. Herman, there are uh, two uh, questions. Uh, the first yes. one is about the previous uh, slide, slide seven, uh, yes. and that goes: uh, How are the emissions associated with the wind energy in this slide computed? Is it factoring the coal startup? And if so, then with a natural gas plant, for example, would this still hold true? So, so how, okay, so maybe uh, I, I missed something about the approach that we follow here. So basically everything is optimization. So we give the data to the, to the, in this case, a kind of unit commitment problem. And we want to minimize cost. That is the objective. And then in one solution, we force renewables, we fix it. Okay, this is the maximum possible, then do that. Then you can see that, yeah, there is just one option here you need to, shut down the, the unit because there is not enough demand. You need to keep the balance uh, between demand uh, and, and supply. And then, yeah, the, the only option available in our four is to turn on the, the coal unit again. So that is how, uh, by using some realistic data, uh, that is how you see that you need the startup. And then you just have one startup and then you multiply by this and the variable cost of the energy that is used. And in the second, yeah, in this case, yeah, you avoid the startup. Maybe something I didn't mention is that uh, uh, as initial status, we assume that the coal was already producing. So in these four hours, there is no initial startup involved. So I hope I could answer that. I don't know if, what was the other question, Marie? Uh, the other question was, uh, how did you calculate the startup cost and CO2 emissions? Yeah, so the startup cost in, in this case is just because the unit startup once, then you just add that as the cost. 
and and the emissions yeah it, there is the emissions of the of the startup then because that started up once then you add those emissions and all the the production that you have there is the you add it by you multiply it by the variable cost and the variable emissions and that is how you obtain it so uh, then in this example what i wanted to to ask is it's okay, this, what are the marginal prices here? So the marginal prices, okay, uh, in the first hour is just basically what is the cost of providing an extra unit of demand? Then uh, that will be the, the cost of, of the unit one of the CCGT unit, uh, if you have an extra demand. In hour three, that will be the cost of the, of the last turbine unit. And in hour two, you have something interesting that is that if you increase an extra unit of demand there, what will be the price of that? That will be minus 14.2 euros per megawatt hour. And how can you obtain that? It's because when you increase one uh, extra unit demand here in our two, then the CCGT unit will produce that because that is the next cheap option you have. And at the same time, because of the ramping uh, constraints, in our tree, the CCG T unit can provide another megawatt hour because it's coming from a megawatt hour higher from the previous hour. So then one megawatt hour extra of demand in, in our two will allow the CCG T unit to produce two extra megawatt hour and will reduce one megawatt hour of the gas turbine unit. Of the most polluted unit. So that is why you obtain the minus 14.2. Uh, so this is the explanation, but as I said before, this is an optimization problem, and formally you just obtain that from the dual variables. That will be the shadow prices. And then you can do the same with the emissions. So you have the emissions, the marginal emissions, and then you have that in our two, you have also negative marginal emissions. So that means that if you have an extra unit of demand there, you will lower cost and you will lower emissions in the in the system. Then uh, to go to Menti again, then my next question is for this example, is there a better solution for that? And there are different options that you can go to, to Menti again. Um, so then one option is no, the wind is at the maximum array, so nothing, nothing else to do. Uh, another option, to curtail wind in our two. Um, actually, there is a, a, a market signal there saying that there is a negative price and a negative emissions in our two. And another option is to curtail wind in our three. And yeah, that I, I don't know will be the, the other option. So I will give some time. It seems the most popular one is to curtail wind in our two. The second one is to curtail wind in our three. I will give some 20 seconds more before I continue. Even if I continue, you, call, you can uh, continue voting. Oh, but the most popular options seems to be that to curtail wind in our two is a, is a good alternative. So let me continue. Yes, so I should be back in the slides. Uh, so this negative price is saying that, that if demand, if demand increases, uh, yeah, that will lower the cost of the system. But you can also say that the generation can decrease and that can also lower the cost of the system. Uh, why not, for example, the CCGT should decrease because they are profiting a lot from the third hour. So if they decrease more, uh, then they will, they will also decrease the, the profit in, in the third hour. And 
So basically what you see here is that if you curtail in the second hour, the residual load, the net load, is less steep. And then by curtailing that, the CCGT unit can provide the second hour. And then because the ramp is less steep, then that can provide completely the third hour. So you can completely avoid the, the use of the gas turbine, the most expensive and the most polluted unit. And then what about the margin of prices now? Then you cannot paint them the same. Then you avoid the, the, the negative price completely. And the total cost, the average cost and the average emissions of the system, they both increase by 6%. Just because by curtailing wind, you could avoid using a more expensive and more polluted unit. Herman, there is another question. Um, if yes. wind would have no subsidy, or no subsidy in case of negative prices, the market would find the optimal dispatch. So yes. would an investment support do the trick? That is one of the things. This is actually very against uh, 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 the energy subsidies. Uh, yes, a market support based not on energy, but more on capacity. Okay, there are many other reasons why energy or why not, but, but at least focus about pollution and the system. Yeah, more capacity support will will do a better trick. Uh, and here, hopefully, you will see that this is like a clear message. But still, as I as I show in in the first slides, the in many countries in 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 all Europe and even around the world, yeah, they they are being crazy negative bits. So that is what happened. Um, then here I have a, a, another example then with network constraints. This is a little trickier to follow because then uh, yeah, we, you need to, to dispatch the, the, to take into account the network. So here is an example with three buses, then they are all the same reactance values. And there is a capacity limit for the line between bus B and bus C. And there is a wind unit in the bus C, the, and the unit can produce 345 uh, megawatt hour. And this is just one period. And then you have to provide a, a total of 900, beating again the two same units. Then, yeah, let's just start dispatching the wind at maximum capacity. So what happened is that if you dispatch this at maximum, the flow, this unit will overflow this line that will be more than 100 uh, megawatt. And then, if you want to dispatch the next more expensive unit, that will be generation one, the flow will go in the same direction. So we'll make the congestion problem or the overload of the line even worse. The only way to alleviate this congestion is to dispatch the unit two. That is the expensive unit, the gas turbine unit. And then the solution is, yeah, the, the best you can do, you dispatch win and then you dispatch the unit one, the next expensive, just by 10 megawatt hour, and you need to dispatch the, the most expensive unit by 545 megawatt hour. Then I have another question again about what will be the price, the nodal price in this bus C. So you can go to Menti again. And then the question is what will be in the the marginal price in the bus C, then you can have the, the marginal unit there, that is the win, or the cost of the unit one, that is 27.7 euros per megawatt hour, or the cost of units uh, that is in, in, in the bus B, that is the most expensive, that is 69.6, or a, a combination between the two, similar to what we had in the previous example. And yeah, so that, those are the options or just that, uh, yeah, it's, it's, that you don't know. So as I said here, uh, yeah, and, and I repeat again, is that all this is, we're optimizing. So all these examples, they are, they are simple, uh, but we are always applying optimization to be sure that, that we are finding the best solution. So there are always two cases. One case where we force renewables. So we fix it into the system and we say, okay, find the best solution, but this has to be taken by the system. 
And the second option is, okay, the, the renewables are, are bidding at zero, the cost is zero, minimize the cost. If the system finds out that the best is to, is to provide renewables at maximum uh, availability, then the system does that. But the system can curtail it if that, is, if that can reach a better optimal solution. Then in this case, we are forcing the renewables. We are not letting the, the, the problem to optimize. So here I see that the, uh, the most popular option is that the, the marginal cost in C, in the bus C, will be the generation of unit, the wind unit. Yeah, that is more the, the, the more straightforward solution. So let's see, you can continue voting. You see it in, in the phone. But let's see what will be the, the solution to that. So I come back to my slides. Uh, then this something very similar as in the previous example, the marginal price there will be 14.2 euros, minus 14.2 euros per megawatt hour. And something similar happened. If you reduce one unit here of generation here, because of the constraint of the system, you can dispatch, you can alleviate this uh, congestion a little bit, and then you can dispatch the next chip unit, the CCGT, by two extra uh, megawatt hour. And if you do that, because the demand is the same, then you avoid one megawatt hour of the most expensive unit. So, and again, then you obtain the same, that the price in, in, in the past C is, minus 14.2 euros per megawatt hour, and the same for the marginal emissions, it's minus 0 0.17. So, and as, and as you saw in the previous example, then that is a clear signal that, okay, or increased generation, or increased demand there, or decreased uh, generation, because, yeah, that will lower the cost of the system. Then, is there a better dispatch from that? So, the same as in the previous example, yes, uh, the better dispatch, will be, so if we minimize, if we don't force wind, if we minimize the cost, the optimal solution is to dispatch zero megawatt hour of wind. And if we do that, then you avoid the most pollutive unit, and, and then everything can be, sub okay, you avoid, not completely, but you avoid a big production of the most pollutive unit, and then the average cost decreases and the average emission decreases by, by 13%. Uh, Something I want to highlight here is that, yeah, this is dealing with congestion. Then uh, the solution was feasible to force wind, but that was not the optimal. And I want to show here that actually, for example, in, in, in many countries, a free dispatch solution, they have, for dispatching problems, they, they use wind as the, or renewables as the last resort, because they think, no, no, curtailing renewables is not good, then we should avoid that at all costs. And that is by regulation and by law. So here I show that in the Netherlands, actually they spent 50 million euros in 2017, just in redispatching costs. And in Germany, near to 1 billion euros as uh, in the year, as redispatching costs. And, and they, yeah, as I showed there in the reference, actually, uh, when, is redispatch, renewables are redispatch just if the system is a risk. They are the last resort to redispatch. And what I show with this example is that maybe that is not the best solution. So if they are just redispatch optimally based on their true cost, that will be a lot better. But that is what we reproduce in the example. So they can be increased. They want to do a good for the system, but they can be increasing costs and increasing emissions with that. Then uh, why we have curtailment of renewables? Then there are the technical reasons I mentioned before and economic, economical and environmental reasons. So I show here three examples, two for economic dispatch and one for unit commitment, but in the paper they are more elaborated and there are more examples. Then how to increase renewables more efficiently? Uh, apart from subsidies question, then I want to show just a, a summary slide of some cases that, that we have performed here at TNO. 
So I just want to show a case for the Netherlands uh, simulating 2050. There is a, a, a high electrification assumption for hydrogen production of 66 terawatt hours the year. There is an installed capacity for wind of 20 plus gigawatts. And here you see, for example, the two first results that just by adding electrification of that amount of hydrogen, just assuming a constant demand, a constant uh, demand profile, then you have more demand. Then you have a, uh, uh, you can use more renewables. There the curtailment lowers. And the profits for, for the renewables, they increase. In this case, for wind. Just because, yeah, you have more demand, then they can benefit more. But if on top of that, we have demand response to that, so that means that you can invest in higher capacity of electrolyzers, uh, then you can produce more hydrogen when the prices are low and not produce when the prices are too high. Then if we add that to the system with the same demand, then the, the, the curtailment automatically goes down. We are not forcing anything here, it's just okay, they bid zero and what is the best for the system. But the increase in revenues compared with the previous example for the renewables, they increase like by more than 20%. And why is that? Because yeah, the renewables, they consume more in low prices. So they increase the prices, especially during the, the, the low of peak hours. And that is where usually there was curtailment. So they decrease curtailment and increase the prices in that time. So that becomes a very good uh, business for uh, that translating a very good business for the investment of renewables. Um, here, okay, I, I don't want to go into details, but that, that showed that I also lowers 40% of the system cost just by adding a demand response basically because there was a huge uh, savings in investment cost of extra generation just to supply all that demand 24 seven. Then, yeah, maybe the incentives are in the wrong place. Instead of trying to incentivize that heavy renewables to, to be invest, yeah, to, to take place, uh, maybe they should incentivize more demand response or both. Um, so to conclude, I want to go to uh, the final question I have in, in Menti. And I am curious now about your perception now, after I give, after I am almost done with the presentation is, so what about now? At the beginning, I, I asked that, what was your perception? If you think that curtailing renewables could lower pollution, I hope that you could see that that could be the case. Uh, anyway, there is a paper, uh, available that you can check and you can evaluate and, and see if that, that is the, uh, not a possibility. Something I want to highlight again is that the solution shouldn't start with curtailment. I am not saying that we should curtail. I am saying that the renewables should be dispatched with the true cost. They shouldn't have a priority because then you can damage the, the solution of the system, the optimal solution. So then that becomes a counterproductive uh, incentive. So instead of lowering pollution, that, that is the idea of having a push in renewables, what you can be doing is increasing costs and increasing pollution. So it seems that, uh, uh, that at least from the people voting, most of them uh, were more or less convinced. And some maybe, and the others like two others, like no way. Uh, yeah, I invite you to, to read the paper. Maybe there you can find details that uh, in the presentation were not that clear. Then I will move again to the presentation. You can continue voting there. I am very curious to compare this with the first slide to see what is the difference of the perception of the people. Then I come back to my slides. And to conclude, then, yeah, it is a misconception that maximizing the production of renewable always lowers CO2 emissions. So that many people think that that is the way and no, that is what uh, I try to show with examples. Then 
how is that translated in, 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 in actual systems? Okay, you have this the priority dispatch, like for example, the German case, uh, if you have congestion, how to redispatch, the last resource is renewable, but they mainly apply, uh, appear in current system with negative biddings. And that is because they receive energy subsidies. Then those energy subsidies, they are penalizing the system twice. Why? Because they are increasing. They can be increasing the emissions and costs, as I show here. And apart from that, the governments are compensating the renewables by doing that, for doing that. So they are paying renewables to damage the system. So it's expensive to pay renewables and then to damage them. Uh, yeah, at least the energy, how they exist in the current form, the energy subsidies, they, I don't think they are that positive for the system, especially if you have high penetrations where the when you start uh, testing the flexibility of the system. That, that is basically what we try to, to, to show in the examples. And then, yeah, you should dispatch, the renewable should be dispatched according with the true cost. So ideally energy prices should provide a curtailment signal. Like what I showed before that there is a negative price. So there is, uh, it is clear that uh, curtailment can appear there. But that is tricky in actual system because in unit commitment cases and in the market, most of the market, they have markets, they have a unit commitment or a kind of unit commitments that they have non convexity Also here in Europe, it's not called unit commitment, it's euphemia, but it's a kind of uh, unit commitment. And um, yeah, so when, when there are non convexities there, like in the first example with the startup cost, the price doesn't appear it's, it's not that easy to see uh, the, the energy price because there can be other prices and and yeah that depends of the pricing uh, scheme that you have in the that is different in different systems but at least we didn't need to think the the optimal price in the first case to know that curtailment was good as long as they don't be negative and they are dispatched according to a true cost. Yeah, then they can, the system will be operating in, in, in an optimal way, uh, lowering costs and emissions. So that is what we show in the examples. And one question that I usually get is, what about future power systems? Will these examples apply? Uh, because yeah, unit commitment, they're usually seen as the traditional units. But in the unit commitment, yeah, you can have also new units that can be hydrogen, fire, power plants. They can be uh, nuclear power plants, even, Electrolyzers, they have similar constraints. And for example, in, in, in the example of the ramping constraints, you just need one pollutive unit to damage the system. So instead of the gas turbine, or instead of this CCGT, I think that was the, the polluting unit, you can have a, a hydrogen unit. So you can have wind and the other unit that they are not polluted. But if you force wind, there can be one unit that is polluting and then you are forcing the unit to operate. So as long as you have at least one pollutive technology by forcing wind, you can be forcing that pollutive technology to operate. So that, that still applies as long as you have one polluting technology. And yeah, there are many technologies that they have like kind of unit commitment constraints. And I also show examples of economic dispatch. So um, just ramping constraints, they, they yeah, if we don't have super flexible units, or if you go in, in real time uh, dispatches, then the ramping constraints, they are uh, high limiting of many technologies. And you also have congestion. And as example, I, as I show, yeah, as long as we don't have infinite capacities or then these cases can apply. Then the final like takeaways of this is then how to accommodate the high shares of variable renewables in an economical and environmental way by not imposing the, the variable renewable production, for example, by energy subsidies that make them bid, uh, have negative bids, by increasing the flexibility of the system, for example, demand response. And during this energy transition and from now, we really need to use the flexibility of the renewables. They shouldn't be part of just the cause of the problem. They should be seen as part of the solution. So the renewable shouldn't be, the objective for renewable shouldn't be to maximize their output to a system. 
that should be to maximize their value to the system. And that is all. I am still within time, so that is good. So we still have some room for questions. Thank you, uh, Fairman, for this very uh, insightful uh, presentations. Uh, there are indeed some questions remaining. I don't think we're able to answer uh, all of them, but I will pick a few uh, out. Uh, the first uh, question uh, is uh, it's, it's on the, the marginal prices. If the marginal price is minus 14.2 euro per megawatt hour, it means that the CCGT is paying to produce minus 14.2 uh, up to minus 27.7 euro per megawatt hour. Uh, please explain what do you mean with marginal price? Is the, mar is the market or the redispatch mar marginal price? So, uh, if we go here to this example again, yeah. So, this is an explanation how it can be obtained. But this is basically this is the demand, and we want to supply the demand. So we solve an optimization problem for that. That is a linear problem. And the shadow prices, this is not redispatched. This is just the shadow prices that are the dual variable from, uh, from that optimization problem. That is the, how we obtain the marginal prices. That is usually how they are obtained also in, in markets. So even in negative prices, uh, these units are this unit is producing here, and it's optimal for that unit to produce because if that unit says, okay, yeah, I don't produce in hour two because that is a negative price, then they can lower, let's say, to they can lower the production. And, and then it will lose profits the next hour. So something maybe to, to make it, yeah, it's, once you solve this as a linear problem. And you obtain the, the the prices from the dual variables. That is an equilibrium. So everybody that they don't want to move from that position. So uh, that is the optimal solution for for everybody and for the system. Yeah, I hope that answered the question. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, we have a couple of questions left, but I think I see we're running uh, out of time. Um, so in case you have a question still, you can um, email um, Herman if possible. And if you put your name here, then we can uh, reply to you uh, afterwards. So I, I, I would like to wrap up and thank you very much, uh, Herman, for this very insightful and interesting uh, presentation. Um, on behalf of the BAAA, we would like to uh, thank all the attendants for uh, attending this uh, interesting uh, webinar uh, in collaboration with IAEE. And I would like to give uh, the final word to uh, David Williams. Thank you, Marion. And thank you, Herman, actually, for such a wonderful uh, webinar, uh, truly outstanding research you've done, and you've imparted some, uh, some great, great knowledge for our listeners today. On behalf of IAEE, we wish to thank the BAEE for their support in bringing about this webinar. Uh, for those listeners, please be aware that we have recorded this. It will be available on our uh, website for Rewind. You'll be able to listen to this. A kind remember, uh, a reminder to join both BAEE as well as IAEE. You may do this through our respective websites. Uh, thank you once again, Erwin, and uh, I officially close this webinar. Bye now. <laughs>